No one wants to manage databases as if they can avoid it. That's why MongoDB made MongoDB Atlas, a global cloud database service that runs on AWS, GCP, and Azure. You can deploy a fully managed MongoDB database in minutes with just a few clicks or a few API calls. MongoDB Atlas automates deployment, automates updates, handles scaling, and more so that you can focus on your application instead of taking care of your database. You can get started free at mongodb.com slash atlas. Now, if you're already managing a MongoDB deployment, Atlas has a live migration service, so you can migrate it easily with minimal downtime and then get back to what matters. Stop managing your database and start using MongoDB Atlas. Hi, this is Scott Hanselman. This is another episode of Hansel Minutes. Today I'm talking with Dr. Mikaela Grailo. She's going to talk to me about code reviews. How are you? Hi, I'm really good. Thanks. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, I'm thrilled to have you on. I enjoy your podcast, Software Engineering Unlocked. It's a really great show, and you're now about 22 episodes in. Yes, yes, I really enjoy it. It's um, it's an awesome activity. Yeah, I think everyone should have a podcast, shouldn't they? Yes, I think so too. Um, it's really fun. Can recommend yeah. it. So um, we're going to talk about code reviews, but before we do, I thought it was interesting to explore the practice of code reviews is not really something that people learn in computer science class, uh, do they? Like, you have a PhD, you are a doctor. Yes. Is your PhD in computer science? Um, no, my PhD is actually in software engineering, um, but I have a master's degree and a bachelor degree in computer science. So I, I know both worlds a little bit. Okay, so you say you know both worlds, but do most people, do most professional engineers know that there's a difference between those two things, do you think? Well, I don't know if they know, but there is. I was not aware of it, or not so much. So when I uh, joined my PhD program and I had this master's degree in computer science, I was not really prepared of what I will get myself into. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> it was, even though my computer science um courses were more practical than at other universities. So my university was like uh, very proud of the practical aspects that they had. But then doing the doing the PhD in software engineering, really, it was a completely different world, right? So we weren't thinking about networks, for example, right? Or, or protocols and things like that, which I learned in the computer science course. But we were really looking about the practices, how people are doing um, how, how they're developing software, how people are interacting with each other, maybe design patterns, right? So it was really about programming and developing software, working with each other. Maybe there was even, you know, a, a, the part of the soft skills or, you know, how Scrum will be something that I have never heard of in my computer mm -hmm. science degree, actually. But I heard about, you know, um, different uh, layers <laughs> and the, how, the, how the computers are actually built and, you know, how you would send a message, what it actually means, right? Um, and then in the software engineering um, track, you were really talking more about how to design the software. So it wasn't a complete different abstraction layer, I would say, right? Um, and I, I was a little bit surprised by that. It took me probably half a year <laughs> to get used to and really, um, yeah, to learn that also. I had, I had to learn a lot of things there um, that I haven't, that I haven't learned in, in the, actually it was five years, right? Master's and uh, bachelor was five years of education that I haven't heard of there or not in depth, right? So I worked during my match, uh, uh, bachelor's and my master's in as a software engineer. So I heard of a couple of things, but like really in depth uh, was at the PhD. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I am a little bit biased myself because um, I have a degree in software engineering. And uh, there were, th when I got into industry, there are things that my computer science degree coworkers knew about that I didn't have familiarity with. But like when I joined my software engineering you know, degree at my university, we started learning about unit tests and extreme programming was starting in the nineties and we were doing pair programming and all of these, these techniques that were very, uh, I think the word is socio-technical mm -hmm, practices, mm -hmm. like how do humans get together and make, 
you know, make software as a team, uh, while computer science seemed a lot more abstract. And it, it seems like computer science people learn how to do a bubble sort and uh, uh, t- software engineering people learn about all of the things around how a team would ship a bubble sort. Yeah, I think, yeah, maybe bubble sort isn't the best uh, <laughs> example, I think. I'm but yeah, if you, basic, like, but yeah. If, if you think about messaging protocols or also um, one of my specialties was security, right? So mm-hmm. all the handshakes that you do or the protocols or the algorithms behind those things, uh, we were learning that, right? We were designing that. Um, and as a software engineer, you're, you're applying what computer science or scientists do right. So what they are, for example, they are doing they're doing the the um, RS, RSA uh, algorithm, for example, right. And you're just applying it. You're you you know that you have to uh, call that um, that package or you know that, that that class or something like that, right. So um, I, I think it's practical, but on a very different level. Maybe that's the right thing. No, I think that I think that cryptography is a great. That's a very good example. Certainly better than my example. The idea that there are the scientists that are thinking about the science of how computers should think about cryptography. Yeah. And then there's me who just calls the library. Yes, exactly. Yeah, and so, for example, when I was doing my master's, I was um, involved in uh, the standardization of voice over IP, right? And so something like that would be more, I think, a computer science activity probably, right? Really thinking of how could, could we do that? And, you know, what are some of the things here? Um, I would say that's a little bit more on the on the side of computer science, but I think it's, it's also, you know, whatever you like to do, um, this is where you get the best in. So uh, also as a software engineer or with a software engineering degree, if you, if you do stuff like this, you get really good at it. I definitely agree with that. I mean, you should pick the degree or the direction or even being self-taught, mm-hmm. the thing that makes you happy and the thing that feeds your spirit. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Now, um, code reviews are like your favorite thing. Like that's your consulting practice and you talk about them all the time. Like you love code reviews. Um, You find it to be quite a fascinating engineering practice. Yes. And it's exactly uh, because of what you said, like the socio-technical aspect, right? So it's very, very technical. You have to know what issues to look for. You have to be very good, you know, in, in, in the frameworks that you're working with, in the language, in the best practices, in the design patterns. So this is the technical aspect of it. But then there's a lot of social skills that you have to do or to master to uh, be really an effective code reviewer, but also um, the receiver of code reviews, right? So how do we communicate with each other? How do we form the team? There's also a lot of process. So it's, it's really, really fascinating because it's not only about one person. There's so many perspectives on code reviews, right? It starts with that you have those two perspectives of the person that writes the code and the person that reviews the code. But then there is also the organization, right? The team. And how does code review work for the team? Because if it works well for two people, doesn't mean that it works well for the team. Or, for, you know, if, if one person, like the, the person that gets the code reviewed, gets a lot out of it, um, does this mean that the whole team strives with code reviews or gets get gets the best out of code reviews. Then there's this organizational perspectives. People have different goals for code reviews, why they're doing it, right? So they, they have, uh, they're multifaceted also. They have like a lot of benefits. Um, let's say learning, mentoring, right? Um, it's collaboration. You know what's going on, team awareness. It's obviously also improving the solutions. Um, but on the other hand, there are also a lot of pitfalls with code reviews, right? So how do we make sure that people are nice to each other, <laughs> uh, but they're also candid? And, and so th- this is, is a very, very fascinating topic. Yeah, I, I love it. Code reviews are interesting because for some people, they are the thing about their job that they, um, they dread. It's like being interviewed at a job you already have, and nobody likes interviews. And now... It's like, okay, I've, I've worked quietly by myself to make some code, and now I have to go, like, like with a PhD, and then have my thesis judged in front of a group. Uh, people find code, some people find code reviews to be very stressful. Do they have to be stressful? I don't think that they have to be stressful, but they definitely can be very stressful. And I think it's very important that we are aware of that and that we you know, acknowledge this fact that they are a stressful activity or that they can be a stressful activity, even if you don't feel it is, 
a stressful activity. So um, I, I say also say that the da- most dangerous teams are the ones that think code reviews are just a nice, you know, collaboration thing. Um, so if you're if you're really blind to all these problems or pitfalls that you can um, get yourself into with code reviews, I think that's that's uh, one sign of an al- unhealthy, um, a little bit blindsided uh, perspective. So. Mm. I think it really depends on the team dynamics. I have worked with a lot of engineering teams, different engineering teams, different organizations. And um, the more hierarchical maybe the organization is, the more I see that code reviews are more stressful for the people, right? Um, And then like measurements uh, can can add a lot of pressure to people, right? That if they are judged, I mean, one of the... I work also with engineering managers or, you know, people that want to measure the success, for example, of code reviews. Um, and uh, and I always try to get them away from, for example, measuring the bugs that they are finding, right? So, uh, for example, you could measure how many bugs are you finding in code reviews. And who, the, the worst thing is who made the bug, <laughs> linking mm. that back to that person. If you are starting something like that, if that's your conception of how you do that practice and how you measure success and... Um, well, the effectiveness of your code reviews, I think it can be a very, very serious, very pressure-like activity, right? That I wouldn't enjoy either. Um, I'm I'm not very stress resistant, for example, if it comes to interviews. I hate interviews. Um, mm-hmm. And so I think the people work the best if they are not stressed and if they if they feel safe. And there's also a lot of research that shows that. Um, if you have like psychological safety, right? This means that you can mm-hmm. make make mistakes. You can talk about problems more openly. Um, these are also the most effective teams and uh, the teams that have the most innovation. And I think, yeah, this is something to strive for. And we should really think about how can we bring that into code reviews? How can we make it mm-hmm. not that stressful for people? Now you say that the teams that are more effective are the ones that feel like they're they're psychologically safe. They can make mistakes. They don't feel like they're being judged. They feel like they're being lifted up as a group. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, software is a is a for lack of a better word is a hard science in that there's either bugs or there's not. One organization might feel that they want those metrics and they might put numbers up on a leaderboard and say, "Look, Scott has nine bugs, and we find them every time we do a code review. Every time." We go to a code review, we see how bad of a programmer Scott is. That can, you know, like you could apply hard numbers to humans, which would maybe be the very cold and computing way to do things, but it would probably hurt people's feelings a lot. Like how important is it to be compassionate versus being precise and correct? I think that it's a, it's not only a slippery slope, right? That would be, well, it's, it's maybe... A slippery slope would be if you think that's a good way to increase the the bugs that people find, and you know you increase the the preciseness or the um, rigor with what people are working. But that's that's false. That's not happening. What's happening if you have like a board and you have like this stack rank or whatever, right? Um, mm-hmm. And you have like uh, Scott has the most bugs what's happening is that people adjust their behavior right and they're adjusting it not only as an individual but also as a group um so people will start gaming the system so you will not find the bugs anymore and you will not find them earlier we'll find them later because people were trying to bury the bugs right so it's it's going into the complete different um, direction apart from being you know empathetic or, you know, um, is that the right English word? I hope I mm-hmm. pronounced it correct. <laughs> um, um, or, you know, like being nice to each other or coll- collaborate well, which this is also very, very important. I see it's, I would say it's even more important, but to motivate a person that has this idea of, I, I'm putting up, an, uh, you know, maybe a, a board and ranking the people the people are showing how many bugs they are finding or, you know, doing retrospectives on, on those things. I think the m- main motivation factors to people to get people not to do that is to explain that it's really counterproductive, right? It's mm. not even being about nice. It's about if you want your software to suck more, <laughs> then you do that. <laughs> I can guarantee you that it's going in the wrong direction um, for the quality of your software systems, for, you know, for the collaboration of your team and everything. 
Have you ever wondered if you can be offering a faster, less buggy application experience for your customers? With Raygun Application Performance Monitoring, you have all the information you need at your fingertips to find and fix errors and performance problems across your tech stack down to the line of code. Raygun makes it easy to monitor the impact of your performance improvements, quickly identify and resolve issues, and see how your code performs in the hands of your customers, saving you time, money, and sanity. I've personally used Raygun on my iOS apps, and when a user hits a crash, those crashes get centralized into one location, they get bucketed automatically, I'll get a call stack and an email with a line number where things were crashing. It felt to me that I got a gift from my customer in the form of a bug report that I could actually solve. Head over to raygun.com and try it out for yourself. That's R-A-Y-G-U-N.com for a free 14-day trial. The, uh, you've got a really great uh, blog post on your, on your website called Respectful and Constructive Code Review Feedback. And you've really broken it down into like the top 10 things that one can do when doing uh, code reviews. Have you ever had anyone push back and just say, hey, it's about the code. We should stop worrying about people's feelings. It seems like software engineers sometimes have a bit of a reputation of being quite um, hard and not, they don't like the soft skills or the squishy parts. But I found this to be a great article that, that gives it, made it clear how to, how to have a communication with someone about their code without making it personal. Thank you. Yeah, unfortunately, <laughs> I have, I have, and I always have, I always encounter people, right? And I really try to listen and to understand where they are coming from. Um, I recently recall working with somebody from open source and they were really proud of their, you know, rigor and they were very aware that, for example, the, the way that they communicated about things and the co- way they did their code review is very harsh. They call it harsh, right? Um, but they somehow saw this as a badge of honor a little bit. Like, you know, you have to be at that level to, you know, get your code reviewed and, you know, to be, you know, get the thing merged and things like that. Um, and also like toughen up attitude a little bit, right? So makes we have- it like a gauntlet. That it's not a, it's not a, uh, I mean, a gauntlet or a, um, uh, what is it called? A, uh, I was watching this show and they go through a um, obstacle course mm-hmm. and they look, look how hard that was. That thing that I just did. Yes. Like, I exactly. want a code review to feel like that. Yeah, exactly. So th- this is, but I really saw that there was a lot of pride, right. For mm. that it's so hard and they are so harsh and, you know, it could be that they're just rejecting it and then you're getting a very rude comment <laughs> and, and I still, I got through it or, you know, I made it, I, tried it 10 <laughs> times and then then I was accepted in this yeah. I don't want right? a t-shirt that says I survived a code review at Google <laughs> yeah exactly yeah exactly and and this was a little bit the attitude right um but yeah I'm, I'm not I'm not uh, supportive of that <laughs> so mm-hmm. I really think that it's it's not I wouldn't like to work in that uh, organization or this was not open source in that community, right? So I think you are driving away a lot of people that don't get their pride of, you know, being, you know, being rude or, or or surviving rudeness of others or something like that. I also think that it it comes back to similar things, right? That you are um, you are holding back, you're holding yourself back, right? If you are in this environment, um, even uh, there's a lot of competition in this environment, right? So there's a co- lot of comp- competition, and people strive to be their best selves. Mm-hmm. I definitely get that, yeah. But they're their best selves. They are not the best team. They are not collaborating well with each other, right? So it means also that uh, maybe I'm sitting in front of a, a problem that I could solve easily if I'm asking somebody else. But because there is this pride and there's this competition, I'm going to solve it alone. <laughs> and mm-hmm. uh, I will spend a lot of time, wasting a lot of time. I can also call it waste a lot of time, right? Trying to solve the thing on my own. And then um, you also have like, I, I'm thinking about, you know, I have two little kids. Um, <laughs> and the worst thing, if you want them to you know do something and, and is that you tell them that they are wrong, then they're not doing it, right? Because they're losing their mm-hmm. face. And and this happens also in these environments, right? So if you then would say, well, this algorithm doesn't work well, or I have a better solution, you know, you always have to, you know, work with egos here. And so I think it's just not a really good environment also for the, the community, for the software that is created. I think it would be better if we are not in this competitive, uh, competitive state, right? We are not trying to be the 
our best selves in a way that it's just us and our ego and our code, but mm -hmm. that it's the the code that is produced as a team. And um, I think the code reviews are also so powerful because you have this perspective. So if you're able to get that, if you're if you're able to get your team to get yourself to a state that you're open to receive what others are seeing, and then mm -hmm. and the message must also be uh, respectful and constructive, right? Then then you can be you can come up with really really great solutions, much better solutions than one person can do on their own. One of the one of the, the the best of these ten examples, and we'll put all of the links in the show notes to your great articles on code reviews at Google and code reviews at Microsoft. You can take a look at awesomecodereviews.com and the workshops that you give uh, mm -hmm. you know, around the world. Uh, you talk about these things. The the tip that I like the best is the no condescending words. I feel like the number one word. If you could do one thing to make your relationships with your your other fellow engineers better, is to remove the word just. From yeah. your interactions, it's such a silly, small things. And I'll tell I'll tell someone this advice, and I'm like, really? Is it that big of a deal? If someone works all day on the greatest new algorithm that was ever, and then you say, well, why didn't you just, <laughs> in one word, you tore apart days or weeks or months of work, and implied that it was just like just a button, or didn't you just make the you know use just this library? It's just the worst feeling. Yeah, I definitely agree. I think one of the things that I focus uh, a lot in my workshops, and I th see also that people really, this is a little bit transformational for them, right? That it really eye-opening is these two perspectives that mm -hmm. even just is no means nothing to you, right? You can write a message with just, and now if you're coming back to these you know, very harsh comments and people are writing themselves, for them, it's not that bad, but then seeing the other perspective, the other person that for them just makes it a big deal, right? It's a big deal for them. So very often in my workshops also, we go through some real life code review feedback and then I have mm -hmm. people vote on it, right? Do you think this is a good feedback or not? And you see that, you know, not everybody agrees. And this is exactly the problem, right? Not everybody agrees and one person is really hurt, but there are some steps and in, in, in this uh, in this article that you, you just mentioned, there are the 10 most uh, popular things that you can really easily uh, reduce or not do and uh, get more people, you know, that they are happy about their feedback or that they are open to to receiving this feedback and uh, that the, the whole conversation is, is in a better flow. So really have this perspective that even though if I'm not heard by that, another person might be and they might not even say it, right? Mm -hmm. You also talk about people being very kind of, I guess, a little bit crisp they 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 are themselves acting like a computer, almost like the code review is a human being a compiler error, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they'll just say you know rename that variable. Yes, but but it really should be it should be prose. You're talking to a person. You should be giving full sentences and trying to be clear about the why. Yeah, I think there are so many traps with code reviews. Exactly at that point, so. There is a lot of research about written communication and um, spoken communication, right? So if I'm, I'm talking to you, even if you don't see me, right, there's a, a big difference than if we are writing emails. There's a lot of miscommunication, misinterpretation happening in written communication. Um, and, and I think this is really the essence of, of that. If I'm in front of a computer, right, I'm in this in this program i'm also getting myself into this mindset that i'm actually you know and also as a, as a software engineer now we're having this algorithmic um way of thinking and now we are in this program and i think this is what's happening we think oh this variable should be renamed right so this is what what we have and we are in this mode and now you're writing and you're commun but at that moment, you're not really communicating with another person. You're writing something into a text field, right? Or a text mm -hmm. box or something. And then um, I also, what I do for my research and to really understand how people do code reviews, I, I, watched, I watched a lot of people do code reviews. And I really see this behavior very often by many people, even by people that have done a lot of code reviews that are very, you know, um, engaged in open source, for example, and that give very, very good and very, um, respectful feedback. I see that they're also in this process very often that they're writing it and they're like going through the code like a compiler. They're getting very technical and then they have to stop themselves before sending the feedback and saying, oh, 
this is actually a person that I'm talking to, right? Switching mm -hmm. the perspective and saying, well, uh, now it was about finding the errors or better uh, solutions or something like that. And now it's about communicating. So I'm uh, communicating with somebody else and now I'm rephrasing what I actually note down. I also, I'm in academia, I reviewed a lot of um, papers, scientific articles of people, right? And I think it's a very similar process again, where you first go through this paper, you're reading the whole paper and I'm making a lot of notes everywhere. Oh, this is wrong, or I don't understand this here. But these are notes, mental notes for myself. When I'm writing the feedback to the person, I really try to understand, well, now I'm talking to a person that spent a lot of time for this article. <laughs> how can mm -hmm. I, how can I help them also? You know, how can I add value with my comments? Not only I don't understand that, or this doesn't make sense, or this is wrong, but how can I add value for them? And I think this is a very important thing that we should ask ourselves before pressing the button and send, sending the feedback over. That, that an add value is actually one of the items on your list that you point out, like the whole point of the code review it's not to catch someone and say, ah, I gotcha. That was mm -hmm. wrong. The compiler didn't know, but I knew. It's to add value. The whole point is to give, you know, feedback is such a generic word. Yeah. You know, I'm giving you feedback. Well, okay, take it or leave it. But yeah. adding value is very unambiguous. It's very clear. Um, and the other thing I wanted to mention that I think is so important is that this isn't like, an opinion that we're talking about, like this list here and the different things that you talk about, correct me if I'm wrong, but this isn't like, oh, you know, Dr. Gryla thinks that we should be nicer in code reviews. That's not the takeaway. You have actual research that says you will be a better team and you will have fewer bugs if you have more, um, if you have better code reviews that are not dysfunctional. Is that correct? Yeah. So what was really at the heart of everything or what's what's very important to me is that I try to get as much as possible empirical evidence for everything, right? So I'm also coming, my software engineering PhD is in empirical software engineering. This means that we are doing experiments and we really try to find out how are our practices shaping our software and how are our interaction shaping our, you know, um, our teams and things like that. And not only by, you know, we are guessing or we are, we are having an opinion on that, but really by doing some experiments, doing, you know, user studies, um, doing, I, I did a lot of data analysis for that as well, right? I also did that uh, while working at Microsoft. We had like a, a lot of engineering data. And so we could really understand, for example, um, feedback. How can you boost your code review feedback? What was one of the research questions that we had? And so we not only talk to the people. Uh, so what I really like to do is I combine qualitative and quantitative research. So this means qualitative means, for example, observing people or interviewing people. So you can only do it for, let's say, a bunch, like 20 or 50, right? There's a, there's a limit how much you can do. And then taking those insights and doing quantitative studies. So like surveying 1,000 engineers or looking at what we did, 2 million code review comments. And, and we built a classifier where we try to really see, you know, what are some of the things that are valuable to people? What is useful code review feedback? And so uh, by everything that I teach and that I work on, I really try to have it grounded in, in data, um, either, you know, data that comes from, from people or data that comes from engineering data itself. Yeah, and that data, that knowing that that is there's science behind this, I think, is a way to prevent people from saying, "Oh well, you know, Dr. Greider says we should just be nicer in in yeah. our code reviews." This is this is going to make your team better. There is science behind this. is a really important thing to remember. I also think that coming back to you know the person that you said, well, have I encountered? And there's not only one person, right? I'm working with a lot of people. Um, so if if you have people and you present them this data, and then they can ask me a lot of questions, right? They have mo most of the time I have some further answers for them or some further research that they can also dig into themselves and really understand where I'm coming from or why this is important. Then it not only helps them, you know maybe change a little bit but, but their mind, but also create change in their communities, in their teams that they are in or the people that they are working with, I think. It's it's not only, as you said, it's not only me saying, well, you should be nicer, but there's also, there's a more grounded 
um, theory and also practice around that where you can see that it's actually working and people want to yeah, apply that as well. So for, for actionable things that people who are listening to this podcast can do. So if you're listening to this show and you're one person and you're going to then hit stop on this podcast and go back to your team, would you point to your your top 10 tips as the first place to start? And then are, where else can they do? Are there books that one could learn about how to take this uh, knowledge back to their team and make better code reviews? I think my article is a, is a good uh, point for, for starting. I also have a YouTube video actually about this article. So if you're more mm -hmm. a visual person, you can see that. I'm also writing a book right now about uh, code reviews and um, I will pack everything that I learned over the, the, the last almost 10 years uh, into that book. Um, on my blog, there is a lot of things that you can, can see, but there is also a lot of software engineering research out there. So if you're more a research uh, person, right, that really likes to read an, uh, those articles, IEEE or ACM um, has some or different journals. I also like to, for example, in my uh, blog, I try to take some of those research articles and make them into more digestible units, right? Because uh, sometimes it's really hard to read those articles. They are a little, getting a little bit boring, right? People, mm -hmm. There are some things that only academics are interested about. Um, so what I try to do is also take some of those things and get the most applicable things out there. Fantastic. So people can go to awesomecodereviews.com and you'll find yourself on Dr. Makala's website. You can see the workshops that she gives. You can click and become an early reader of the book and help shape the book. And be sure to check out her podcast and her YouTube. Thanks so much for chatting with me today. Thank you so much. It was a really pleasure talking to you. This has been another episode of Hansel Minutes, and we'll see you again next week. Mm -hmm.